Hello, everybody, and welcome back to That Milan Podcast. Martino Puccio, Matt Santangelo alongside you guys here. Please like, subscribe, comment to the YouTube channel if you have not done so already. We greatly appreciate all the support that you guys have given us. Uh, so, yeah, let's get into it. This one is going to be a very short one. Not much to discuss. We're going to have another recording tomorrow Tomorrow regarding situations with transfers, managerial hires. Today, we're just going to basically stick to Jerry Cardinale's comments today at the Qatar Forum. And then, again, Milan's matchup of the weekend. Matt, we'll start with this beatdown of Cagliari. Uh, five to one in Milan's favor. Pulisic brace. We got to see Leao score. We got to see a Benacer goal. Really vintage Benacer in this game. Um, your overall thoughts? I, I you wrap up second place and basically put yourself in a better position uh, come Champions League pot time. So the only kind of positive you could take away from this. Yeah, I mean it's look we uh, secured second um, you know, t- with two matches in hand the rest of the way. Nothing to play for whatsoever. Um, and I kind of want to just more so harp back on our podcast from a couple weeks ago. If you guys can go check that out, that'd be awesome. Where we had a pretty expanded segment on player usage. We talked about Terracciano, but we also talked about, you know, the outlook for the rest of the season with regards to the squad and some of the younger players getting opportunities to play. There really is no excuse I think at this point, I think there are certain individuals within this team that obviously we know what their futures are, specifically Olivier Giroud, who um, has confirmed joined LAFC. Really heartfelt message to the fans and really good interview on AC Milan's YouTube channel. So go check that out. Um, So he'll he'll get his last burn, if you will, with the club, you know, proper sending off farewell from the fans, which would be very nice. Um, but aside from that, I think there really isn't all that much, you know, to digest from this match. I mean, this is a an opponent that Milan should be handling, um, and they did so. And it's great to see Pulis get a couple goals um, to further pad what has been a great output in his first season at Milan. Um, and getting Leao, getting Benacer. So to see these guys get goals is great, but I think ultimately this sets the tone for the rest of the season. It allows now that excuse to not play some of these younger players to go out the window. And I'm hoping that we get to see that opportunity take shape in the next coming weeks. Yeah. Um, I think that's what a lot of fans are hoping for with this. We have Gabia suspended for the next match and uh, Chukwese season seems to be over, mm-hmm. which we'll get into in a second. Um, but yeah, I mean, listen, uh, I want to talk about Giroud for a second, I guess. I think that would be a kind of a a good talking point here. For Giroud, I think this was a massive success for multiple reasons um, with his stay at Milan. Obviously, his first season lifting the Scudetto, uh, scoring a litany of key goals, uh, maybe not the greatest goal-scoring output. We knew how limited he was going to be at his age. Um, and all the minutes that he's played throughout his career. Not mm. not a prototypical bomber, but essentially what everyone has come to amongst the fan base is that he broke the number nine curse. And the reality of the number nine curse was just this. They didn't get good players. They yeah. just didn't. If Carlos, Baca were number n- if Carlos Baca wore number nine in his first season, everybody would have said the curse was over. But he wore number 70, so... Uh, apparently the curse wasn't over. It was just about good players. This guy brought leadership. He didn't cost much whatsoever. The amount of key goals that he scored, uh, how many times, right? Even within the Champions League run uh, to the semifinal as well. Um, Had his best season in his third and final season in terms of goal scoring output assists. Uh, There obviously were limitations at the end of the day with his age. Can't really hold it against him. He kind of go against what the club was doing in that sense. But to me, Giroud gave you everything you asked for and more mm-hmm. of your Milan, um, especially staying the extra year. Uh, so again, uh, congratulations to Giroud on a fantastic career in Europe. Now he gets to go to LAFC where we get to see our good guy, uh, Tom Bogert report on him. And we get to see Giroud face off against some of the stars. Um, listen, that's a good spot for him. LAFC is a well-ran club within MLS. We saw what he was capable of doing in a top five league still. I think he's got a, a couple of years there where he can make an impact. So so best of luck to him um, over there. I will say we could we could go to this, this beatdown in general for this, right? Pulisic grabbing the brace was great. Um, just kind of 
further cementing on how this was one of the best seasons ever for an American in Europe. We know there's about two games left in the season here um, against Torino and Salernitana, with Torino being this weekend. For me, I think this Pulisic season was a smashing success. Um, just to reiterate it, God knows how many times. Playing well in this one, uh, coming off the bench as well to just provide that. Um, yeah, I, you just couldn't be happier for Pulisic because he basically finishes the season being incredibly healthy. The goal scoring production was through the roof um, on top of the assists, and he was playing out of position the entire time. So shout out to Pulisic for this one. I thought he was great. Um, any other final kind of notes on uh, Pulisic, his performance sort of this season? We've been talking about Pulisic for the entire season, right? I think that was a big talking point coming in. Um, you know, would he be healthy? How much would he produce in his unconventional right wing role? Um, how would he coexist with Rafael Leao? Can they both mm -hmm. be main characters, or is one going to take a back seat and the other is going to be, you know, Batman? One's going to be Robin. And I think at certain points this year, I think it was pretty obvious that they both were really taking on main character roles. And, you know, when you look at the, his uh, Pulisic's goal output or goal contributions, sure. I mean, that's exactly what you would want to see from any sort of signing, right? And the fact that Milan got a player at his age, you know, for 20 million, and he's not making a ton of money. This isn't a player that's making six to seven million per season. And you're getting, what, 24 to 25 goal contributions across all competitions. And you're getting a player that's readily available. And that is showing that he can be a leader. He's a player that is a reference point within this team. And he didn't take a passenger um, you know, role within this, this season, which has been very difficult. So, I mean, I think it's a smashing success, as you, as you mentioned. And I think it really bodes well for you know other players that maybe are looking at this opportunity and saying like i can go to milan I can, you know, as an american and i can have a major impact and i can be a player that maybe you know revitalizes my career at macy milan milan has been uh, notorious for providing that opportunity to fringe players at other clubs you know you could talk about ruben loftus cheek you know i know we haven't really had much conversations around him um in the past month you know controversial kind of player yeah yeah and i think that you know you look at what Milan's approach to uh, recruitment has been, yes, it's to go for younger players, but it's also at the end of the day, opportunity. And if there's an opportunity to get a player that is maybe access to surplus at, or, or access to requirements at certain clubs, Milan aren't afraid to pull the trigger and say, okay, well, we see you as a fit here and make that move. And Pulisic was a prime example of that. And I think people initially criticized it because they were saying, well, he's not really healthy. He hasn't proven that he can stay on the field. And he did that in year one. So I think it really goes to show you that with the right frame of mind going into some of these transfers and scouting and recruiting, you can get really good value from other teams' mistakes and mishandling of that player. And that's what we saw Pulisic in his first year. Yeah, uh, not even to mention, I know Milan have a terrible job of uh, track record with injuries, but Chelsea yeah. is arguably worse. Um, well, Pulisic but... also to mention, and I know I mentioned this a while back, but I know Matteo mentioned it on his broadcast and said that, you know, there was an interview that came out and Pulisic basically said, you know, it was difficult to, you know, stay fit, stay sharp, stay healthy and stay active when he was at Chelsea because when you're getting that one rare opportunity and you're having to just let it go and you're having yeah. to just okay i haven't played real game action in a month or you know a couple of weeks and all of a sudden okay now we're going to give you the start and i have to turn it on it's not the easiest and that's how i think probably he ran into a lot of trouble with injuries mm. whereas at milan i think it was pretty established from the onset that he was going to play a focal role within this team i mean his first game of the year right like came out firing goals, Milan were flying, great results. And he more or less, you know, sustained that production the entire season. There were a couple instances where the drop-off happened. He maybe wasn't sure. getting the goal contributions or you know, the yeah. overall play wasn't there, but the goal contributions were there and it was sort of masking what his form was. But at the end of the day, when you look up and down his stat sheet, you look up and down the fact that he was 3,000 plus minutes 15 goals in all competitions, nine assists. I mean, we're talking about a player that's going to, if the last two games you turn out the way we want, goes double-double in goals and assists. Yeah, That's fantastic for him. 
Yeah. Um, I was trying to pull up the statistic that I had that Christian Pulisic's basically this season, his goal contributions after the match against Cagliari in all competitions equated to everything that Alexis Salamakers did over the yeah. course of his career at Milan. That's the type of offensive production you got. And oh, by the way, he had a good work rate this year. So let's not like, you know, pretend like some fans want to that he wasn't working hard off the ball. He was. And he did everything uh, that was asked of him, and I thought it was a smashing uh, success. Um, as far as his reserve slash backup slash player in his position goes, Samuel Chukwese's season is essentially over after having a thigh strain. He was subbed out in this one. Um, disappointing first half of the season. Difficult to get into the starting 11 for multiple reasons, one of which we just talked about with Christian Pulisic's incredible form. And then on top of it, Stefano Pioli going to Stefano Pioli. So with this 2024 and finally getting opportunities after AFCON, Chukwese played fantastic. Mm -hmm. I really have to say that. There was there was also other situations where he was marginally offside on about three goals, two of which against Sassuolo should have stood. Just absolutely absurd that that was still a conversation. Still slightly offside in another match. For me, Chukwese slowly started to integrate and get comfortable within the 11, knowing, knowing what he had to do and what he had to bring to the team. Uh, he's a dazzling sort of dribbler. He's, he's sort of predictable from time to time, but when he's confident, that's not so much the case. Um, I, I think he's technically bringing so much quality to the side, and to have him and Pulisic on that side is a real... Um, advantage for Milan heading into next season heading into the future years um even um I'm getting a little blurry I don't know why that was kind of mm -hmm. weird yeah you are um but either way the the point was I thought Chukwese as a, as a whole this season I'd probably give him a six out of a ten it was disappointing because you can't ignore that first half of the year he did score massive goals within the Champions League, so that was sort of that plus in 2023. But as far as Serie A goes, it wasn't the greatest. Um, but again, what was sort of your thoughts on Chukwese this entire season while I try to fix my camera? Yeah, I think there were, um, you know, look, I mean, when, when we saw the approach from Milan in the transfer market, right, um, that they were going after multiple attackers, and we were like, whoa, like Rafael Leao is going to have some support in the attack. Like there's going to be far less double teams and triple teams. They're not going to be as loaded on the left side in, in defending him. And we're going to have a little bit more balance in our attack. Okafor, Pulisic, Chukweze. And the conversation was, or at least the conversation that I was having with myself, was how is Stefano Pioli going to manage this much attacking talent? Because for years, we've had Rafa and Teo bombing forward and Giroud. And then on the right side, it was Macias, Salamakers, kind of choose who you want there. And, you know, when we got these two new players in here, it was how is he going to juggle the two? Because it was obvious that Rafa's our starting left winger, so that leaves that right wing spot for minutes. And as you started to see quickly to no, you know, harm of, of his own and no, you know, blame of his own Pulisic hammered down the roll like when you're playing well and you're healthy I don't think anybody anticipated Pulisic being this healthy so I think it almost as if you can maybe blame Pulisic's production as a way to say hey he was so healthy beyond anyone's expectation and wildest dreams so that soaked up a lot of the minutes that we thought Chukwese was going to get now in the back end of the season when Pioli started giving Chukwese that trust and Chukwese came back from AFCON we started to see him showcase what he was capable of at Villarreal in many moments, right? Um, mm -hmm. Very pacey, direct, not shying away from dribbling at players, 1v1, taking them on, you know, swinging that, the crosses in with his left foot back post, and he started to get really involved. I think what started to kind of derail his second half of the season, and you can make a case, you know, this is where things fell apart for Milan in the end, was that Sassuolo game. Because I think that was a prime opportunity for him to play. And you know, he got that opportunity. We had the goals that were taken out, but then his handling the rest of the way was kind of odd. There were moments where we were like, Chukweze has to play. And then we're like, he didn't play Chukweze. So I, I think that there's a lot of things that boil down to his, his you know, uh, if you want to call it a disappointing first season. I think the good news for him going forward is you have that one year under your belt 
You're going into the offseason, clean slate, recharge the batteries. And you know that there's going to be that competition on the right side. So your mental approach and your mindset is going to be a little bit different. How can I better myself? How could I be more of an asset? Maybe I press Pulisic as a right winger. And maybe the new coach that comes in says, you know what? Maybe I want to put Pulisic as a number 10 and be playing with that that three three, um, headed, uh, you know, attack. So. I think that there's a lot of things we can take away from Pulis uh, uh, Juquez's first season. Excuse me, um, but overall, I, I like what I saw in, in many matches. I think you know he had a bit of unlucky spells. Um, to his credit, I think we saw him overcome the mental blocks that Ch- uh, Charles De Quetelari wasn't able to overcome. They're due to a, a culmination of issues, whether it be you know the minutes, the usage, but also comfort and playing in a role that you're familiar with. So what we do, and this is my final point here, Mm -hmm. is it's a bit of a luxury now going into the summer where you know I can pencil in three, four or four attackers. Like I don't have to make the attack a a serious um, conversation come summer. We know the striker striker is the focus. We know that. But unlike in many years past where it's like after Rafa, who else? I mean, you have – Rafa, you have Chukweza, you have Pulisic, you have Okafor. Like you have four guys that you can really look to and say, man, we have a lot of in- interchanging piece- pieces here that could do a bunch of different things for us. If health is on our side, we have really, really good options here. And you add a good striker in there that can produce. I mean, we, we could be looking at a, a vastly different attacking team or a vastly different team in the sense of how they go at the opposition. And I think, you know, Chukweza is going to be a part of that, of course. Yeah, um, a hundred percent. Uh, we'll see what the new manager does. I think that really heavily depends upon uh, the formation. Um, I think Pulisic will get more of a look at the ten. And again, when Loftus Cheek wasn't healthy or playing that well, the fact that there was no Pulisic switching over is just you know an- another thing there. Um, Jared Cardinale was at another conference, and everybody lost their minds because of these comments. Um, I watched the interview. Um, Everybody is freaking out about out of context comments. So this this conference, right? Um, the Economic Forum in Qatar, man, uh, hosted by Bloomberg. Here's just the written comments uh, by Jerry Cardinal. Okay, so it's just our partner and the fans are at Milan. He's just talking about Milan and talking about you know just the league as a whole. He's addressing the league here. This isn't me defending Cardinale. I'm not saying he's the greatest and all that, but you, but people need to understand what these comments are and what they're coming from. And and to me, I think it's funny how this stuff works where everybody just has this assumption and agenda against Jerry. Whether or not he becomes a success at Milan remains to be seen. It's, it's probably not the greatest of situations. But put it this way. He was just talking about the league as a whole. So, like, if a league like Bundesliga had Bayern Munich winning for over a decade straight, Mm -hmm. does the league become less interesting, Matt? Just a quick yes or no. Yeah. Okay. So, Jerry's point was that if you are winning consistently within a league, the league's interest will drop. And that's just a fact. That's just true. Because if you know who's going to win all the time, it becomes less interesting. The same as Juve. He wasn't saying, I would dislike it if my team won the league every single year. Of course he wants the team to win every single year. That's the point. And that's what he also said in that. So, guys, seriously, I understand if you don't love Jerry, but fair is fair. He didn't make these comments like that. So You can also – yeah, and you can also – tie it to many things in pop culture and modern culture, right? You could tie it to when you go to a concert, right? When you go to a concert and you know that this artist or this band that you love go and you go into that expectation as, okay, they're going to play these songs. They're going to do this. They're going to do that because I saw it on social media. And then they throw you a curveball and they bring out like a surprise supporting act. It makes it interesting. It's entertainment, right? Same thing in your favorite TV show, right? Game of Thrones, you go through the list on and on and on when if you keep going through each episode and no one dies off, it gets less interesting. You want to see the intrigue behind, whoa, what happens when this guy's gone or this person is is taken off the show? And it's in many ways, there's not, you know, there's a lot you could take from that and apply to sports, right? Because I think it's absolutely valid that it is entertainment. People forget that part of it, right? We talk about American football. We talk about the back. We talk about basketball. 
right? If you're having LeBron James and the Lakers win every year, you, the parody's not there. So they're like, I'm not going to tune in. They're going to win. It's not really that interesting. But when you have a called team the Farmers that, League. Yeah. If you have a team, like prime example, what, what what's made the Bundesliga so unique this year? You brought Harry Kane in. Everyone's like, nah, Bayern's going to win. They got Harry Kane. And here you come, Bayern Leverkusen. They go on an unprecedented run, 50 games unbeaten, out of nowhere, with a coach they just hired in October 2022. For a team that's never won the league. Second bottom. Second bottom that's never won the league, and they win the league. It's great for the sport. If you're not, if you're buying the league, it's not for you. But this is what he is basically referring to here. He's not saying that we want a new team to win Serie A every year. He's the owner of AC Milan. Of course, he wants to see his club. And his he's literally said it. He's been on the off. record saying it. Yeah. yeah. So people are going to take things out of context. You got to ultimately look at it and say, well, who's putting these sort of um, non-contextual, you know, tweets and stories out into the public? Because we know Twitter is a fun place, right? There's a lot of trolls. Yeah. There's a lot, of, a lot of people that just put say anything. So I, I, I think if you just take a step back and look at his comments, but I think naturally people are going to have their own feeling towards Jerry because. You know, he's very, very public. I mean, I will say that he's in, he's going to a lot of these events. He's mm-hmm. talking to newspapers. He's very public. And he's not sort of one of those owners where it's like, okay, I own the club and now I'm just kind of sitting on the sidelines and I don't really care what's going on. Like mm-hmm. Lee Yong Hong and the, the that, that sort of era, Elliot. Mm-hmm. Like there really wasn't too mm-hmm. much going on. We didn't see them too much. So in that case, I think that you know, the more you put yourself out there, you get exposed to people misrepresenting and misunderstanding your actual words. And I think that that's kind of the case here. Yeah, it, again, I, I don't even think this stuff was sort of out of context. I think fans see red, literally not because of Redbird. They see red whenever they see Jerry's name appear because they associate Jerry with losing, they associate him with Saki Maldini, yeah. selling Tonali, yeah. not investing as much money as they would want. Yeah. Jerry is who he told you who he is. He wants a sustainable model. And to do that, it's not by injecting capital every single year. Do I love the way Jerry is doing things? No, of course we want the guys who are going to spend unlimited money like PSG and Manchester mm-hmm. City and not have to worry about anything. Or have the situation that Juve is in. Obviously, they're on a tighter budget than most teams. Why? Because this team did not make a profit for nearly 20 years. Again, not making an excuse for Jerry. I am allowing everybody to understand what the situation is. And and I was getting a lot of replies, and I just want to address it in here because people were replying for questions for um, the podcast. Everybody is just, I mentioned Bayern as a model. I mentioned Bayern as a model because they don't inject capital constantly. They built a sustained winner. Yes, I understand the Bundesliga is not as competitive as Serie A or all these other leagues for many reasons, right? But the model is this by Bayern. It's making smart moves. It's competing for titles, which Milan still have to do. Don't get me wrong. But what is more likely to happen? The way that Bayern does things or the way that Manchester City does things, or a PSG. Those are not possible. That's not even in the realm of possibility. The most realistic situation to get yourself into, albeit very difficult because there's more competition in Italy, is a Bayern model. And and Liverpool even followed the same as well. There's obviously not as much money when you're not playing in the Premier League. But the fact was this. If you make smart moves and you're going to have to make sales, the fact that people think you don't make sales is silly. Cristiano Ronaldo was sold from Manchester United. They still won leagues after that. Again, Real Madrid sold Cristiano Ronaldo for $100 million. Guess what? They're playing in their second Champions League final, not with even six years out of doing that, right? Teams can sell players. It happens. You could still have success. But the point is this. You have to be wise about it. And we'll see if Jerry and this management are going to do that. Look at Liverpool. Um, just, probably one, just one quick prime example off sure. the top just to add on. Liverpool sold Philippe Coutinho, right? Yeah. Look what they did with that money. Yeah. Look at what, look what they were able to build off that. Not That wasn't directly the only thing that led to their sure. success. Obviously, a great coach, Klopp, and, and a good, clear, defined vision for the project. But 
you know, everyone's going to look and say, like at the time, like, oh, he's so Coutinho. He's great. He's 24. Why'd you sell him? And sometimes you, you know, you make those decisions. And I'm not saying this is always the case, but there's a reason why these guys that are in the positions they are to make decisions or we're just sitting here with Twitter fingers and typing on social media. Like, I'm not it's, saying it's Jerry's. I'm not, I'm not trying to be a Jerry apologist because I know people will say that me and you are, being fair. are Jerry apologists and we, we said this was going to happen. We said Jerry was going to do this. And this is what, what the project was going to be under Redbird. That I think the jury's still out. This has been year one, right? I think we that was our first good. summer. And they said they were going to yeah. pocket the money after the Tonali sale. We Don't did some good things. That. We brought in some good players. There's still some players where the jury's out on, right? Going forward to how much those investments are going to pay off in the end. But I think where we're off financially, where we could be headed under a new coach, and how much we could potentially be spending on the market. I think it's obviously going to be a very You're pivotal have a summer. Million. But I think, Martino, this is the summer. Yeah. This is the summer. Because if we still sit in metal between second, third, and fourth, and we're They're not quite on right. that same level competing with Inter, then the mob is going to definitely come out. And I think they have every right to be because we go from winning a Scudetto to second place and our rivals beating us up every single time we face them to not going and heading in the right direction, right? So it looks like we're kind of showing regression and taking a step back. I, so I, I this think is a it's a pivotal summer for Jerry and for, for Milan. Not I think pleasure. it's funny with the regression because that summer market, even Redbird did not own the team until September. So they didn't even control the market um, in the summer of 2022. Uh, that was a bad market. They didn't do a great job, okay? I love Maldini. I love everything that they built, but it was a bad market. It was bad. It, was. it, it just, results speak for themselves, right? And the funnier thing is that outside of a semifinals Champions League run, the season was a disaster. It was awful. They only got into the Champions League because Juve were cheating again. That's the only reason as to why that they got back into it. So if we look back on that, the past management also deserves blame. They did a terrible yeah. job in Serie A in one of the worst title defenses of all time. And people want to pretend like that didn't happen. It did happen. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. they had to fix something. When new guys come in with new ideologies, they have to do that. Again, how many times do we have to say, do we love the Tonali sale? No, probably not. But what did it do? Did it fix a lot of things? And mind you, by the way, the reason that Milan were eliminated from some of these competitions so early was because of the manager that was hired by previous management. Yes, did this current management decide to keep him? Of course they did, because they wanted to give him one more year which a ton of a, a, a purely apologists wanted to begin with. So let's let's stop the bullshit before people come in fluttering in with comments like purely this, purely that. And I know a lot of you were, were kind of off on purely as well. I get that. I respect that. But the fact was this, not everything bad that happened this year with Milan was because of Redbird. There's also issues that stemmed from past management and past ownership. And the mm -hmm. reason why Milan can't spend, by the way, it's because of shitty ownerships in the past and shitty managements. Why do you think they have FFP restrictions? Because we had dummies spending hundreds of millions of dollars and inflating the wage bill for players that stunk. There was no clear idea. Fasobelli was one of the worst things that you could ever imagine. Even Leonardo when he was here, awful as well. There's so many different things that went wrong for Milan that are still stemming today that Maldini and Masada had to clean up, and they're still going to have to clean it up now. Um, so for me, I think there's a lot of room that they have to grow. I do have to remind fans of this, and I'll, and I'll just make this final point before we get to your questions. Milan still finished drastically behind Inter this season. There's a lot of ground to make up. They still finished third in their group in the Champions League. They got eliminated by Roma in the Europa League. They were embarrassing against Atalanta, okay? There's quite a few reasons for that, the majority of which are managerial. They have to get the managerial hire correct. And I was making this point earlier today, Matt, and uh, with Ali Fisher, we were having a conversation. I was saying that balance is probably the most important thing a manager can bring to this team. Because if you simply just play a little bit more conservative and pragmatic, you don't nearly concede as many goals. And if you don't mm -hmm. concede as that many goals or make these individual errors, you're probably in more competitions. Because we know that Dortmund match at home, disgusting, disgraceful, right? The, the lapses in so many other games, um, even Atalanta in the, in the Coppa Italia as well. Opening well. two games of the Champions League. That's set yeah. the tone for everything in Europe. Uh, yeah, 
And and listen, and I think there's a lot of blame to go around, and including the players, by the way. This isn't just like everybody just likes to make players blameless. They need to play better, quite a few of them. Um, so we'll see. I think there's going to be some improvements. I think there's a chance to get out to the knockout stages. Um, so we're heading to your questions right now, and we love when you guys respond to these. There's a couple a lot, of silly I was keeping tabs there. on my feet. There's a couple silly ones we got from our boy Saj, otherwise known as Saturion. Um, is Pulisic our new small team killer? And he said it with the cry eyes, like as in like, oh, my God, adorable. Um, I mean, listen – if people don't know, and this was always an argument that we have with Pepe Risha about Messi, he's like, Messi doesn't score against the, the best in the in La Liga. It's like, well, he scores all the goals against all the other sides, and he did anyways, but that's besides the point. But he was scoring all these goals against these lesser sides because those points matter just as much as the games against the top teams. Three points to three points. They, don't, they aren't more valuable than the others. Um, the goals that you score, sure. Is it easier to score against them? Absolutely, for many reasons. But I think having a guy like Pulisic who scores on teams like this is a great thing because guess what? Who would always drop points against sides that never got any points in the league? Benevento, a goalkeeper, scores. Yeah. Would have been nice to have someone like Pulisic to not even be in that situation. Um, your thoughts on that? No, yeah, I, I, I agree. I think, you know, at three points are three points. You know, obviously you look to your rival games against your rivals and you want to, get up for those and those feel like they hold more weight, at least from like an emotional and psychological standpoint um, and optic standpoint, of course, when, you know, Inter are battering us every time we turn around, it's not a good look despite us finishing second. Um, but I think at the end of the day, when you look up and down these leagues, with the exception of maybe the premier league, right? I think that you can look and maybe there's a little bit more depth and you have teams that are, you know, going to finish outside of European spots that you maybe would be more, competitive in a Bundesliga or a La Liga. But generally speaking, the majority of teams in these leagues you can deem as being bad, bad teams, right? Yeah. Look at Serie A. Look at the relegation race. As I think everything from 12 on down, 13 on down, there's some pretty bad teams. The distance Honestly. between the worst team in Serie A, like the Salernitanas and the Empolis and the Udinese, who I know, you know won a couple of days ago, and then everybody else, it's not even close. Ultimately, how thing. you handle the teams in front of you and handle the matches at the certain parts of the season is what matters most. And you can look at City and you can look at Arsenal, right? Where everyone looked at City's schedule and they said, well, they have a very light schedule down the back end of the season. And you look at how Liverpool fell off. They had some easy games. They couldn't do it, right? You look at players who get up for the big games and they get down for the games that don't have really have that much meaning in mm -hmm. the grander scheme of things. If you're going to apply that logic, look at Divock Origi. He scored so many great goals for Liverpool. So many big goals, crucial goals, right? Yeah. In the Merseyside Derby, in big the Champions player. League. And he didn't do much of anything maybe outside of that. And then mm -hmm. you have players that feed on the minnows and the bottom of the table teams. And something's got to give, yeah. right? And Messi, Ronaldo, in that conversation, if we're talking about that, they're aliens. You have maybe four good, five good teams in La Liga at that time, right? And then yeah, you have man. teams at Ibar. It's like, yeah, of course he's going to score 30 goals against Ibar. They're a newly re re promoted team, and this is the best player ever. Like, yeah, so that's, <laughs> like, it's, it, yeah I know. It's just, it's, uh, oh, we're going to hold scoring goals against Messi. Okay. Um uh, same one for Ronaldo. Um, but I agree with that. Uh, so we got Joseph Calvo, who actually used to help us out on Milan. Yeah. Report. So hello, Joe. How are you? Uh, odds of Milan addressing all areas in the summer uh, of need. Um, so areas of need this summer is striker, um, right striker, back. center back, Number right six. back uh, at the top of the list. CDM is looking worrying with Ben Central defender. Forward, so what in order, so go in order of most important. Striker. From one through four. Striker. Probably probably right back. Right back, and I would say it's tough. I because after striker, you can kind of mix them. I, anywhere, I, I right? go, I go, I go striker, center back, center defensive, mid, right back. I think right back's at the bottom for me. Yeah. And I only say yeah. that because because the options yeah. for right back are going to be cheaper. 
um, and and something over time. Yeah. I still think a Calabria Florenzi is going to get heavy minutes into next season, but not truly a, a cemented starter. I think someone that eases in over the course of time, kind of like what Benacer was at the start of his career, similar to mm -hmm. Rafael Leao. For Milan, the areas of need, a guy that you need to put in the lineup immediately, you have it at center back, I think, um, because I don't think Chow is quite there yet. Uh, maybe it depends on the manager. If they sit back deeper, we'll see. But center defensive mid, oh, my God, we talk about a 5-0-5 formation all the time. You, you can make we, a case we've needed that for two summers. since. It, it, you, you, you are correct because, again, I love Benacer. I love Benacer. But everyone needs to stop doing this one thing, and that's assuming that he's going to play and be healthy. It's not going to happen, guys. It's not going to happen. Operate under the assumption that Benacer will not be there a good amount of the time. And then you will feel better about yourself. Trust me. It's not a disrespect to him. It's just reflective in what's going on. Um, and then striker. I mean, like this is we're year 15. So <laughs> I'm not going to comment further on it. We'll but, see what but, but, but the question Sorry. was, will we address it? Not what do we need to address? Odds of Milan addressing all the areas, I think, I think a nine out of 10. I think they're going to be yeah. invested in every single position. Yeah. I think, Whether I think or not the fans love it. What really helps Milan this year versus the pre the previous couple of years um, are a couple of things. One, the financial position, the budget is as good as it can be right now. It's going to um, be a hundred million with all the sales. Relative to, to all our spending Columbo. power and our spending potential, right? Like we could have about a hundred million to spend, which is a good amount for Milan. Even, even um, higher. Even while higher. also not having to be in a restrictive position where we have to be like very clear on like what our valuations are players. Like if there's a player we like, we might be able to go a little bit more, a little bit less, but we have some wiggle room. Um, two, we don't have to address many other areas outside of the primary four positions we need to address. And, you know, three, I think that Look, you have the sustained years of being in the Champions League. There's no like one to two years. There's no to well, we need to do it for three to four years. Excuse that we know, frankly, I know like wasn't Maldini's fault, but like that's kind of what we were fed by previous ownership and management, where we're like we need to be there for four to five to six years. It's like we've been consistently in the Champions League now. We won a Scudetto. I think it's pretty obvious now that we're in a position where. You look for us to get three to four players in there on top of the potential outgoing players. I mean, just off the top, CDK and Solid Makers. I mean, you're looking at 30 million plus there, right? Like just kind of right off the bat. Yep. Players leaving on free, Simon Cayer, Giroud leaving. Like there's a lot Caldata. of flexibility that I think Milan are going to oh. have for themselves this summer. Caldara was getting just as much money as any defender. Yeah, way. and he was just letting people know. He hasn't played I, in three years for us, I feel like. I, I, I feel horrible for him. It was one of like the sadder um, transfers, I would say, in, in recent Milan memory. Yeah. He didn't even get a chance. His body just failed him. Um, I, fe I felt bad there. I think you're right. So it's going to be close to $100 million or around $100 million, And I was mentioning this. Macias, Krunic, the wage relief, obviously. CDK mm -hmm. sale. We'll see if he gets flipped this summer. Might stay one more year at Atalanta. Um, obviously, Alexis Salamaker is more than likely getting triggered by Bologna. Now, when you look at that, that's prior to Pobega, probably likely gone. Daniel Maldini, likely gone to Monza. And then Lorenzo Colombo as well. So when you have those three prior to $100 million, those guys can get you around 20 to $25 million combined. And again, that's pure plus Valenza, all youth system players. I think that would be very important for Milan to capitalize on. And guess how you reintegrate uh, some more homegrown talents? Promote Kevin Zaroli, promote Francesco Camarda, Bartizaghi, these younger players, even Simich. We'll see what happens with Simich. I think when you promote players like that, it helps you in the long run because that's the way the ecosystem is supposed to work at a club like this. You promote some of the guys, you have them within the team. If they prove that they're not good enough, you go ahead and sell them. If they're good enough, they stay. Simple. Um, let's see. We got one from Omar. Can we see you guys box instead of talking about Milan? What is this um, like? A, what is this like? A influencer boxing oh, space no. that they want no, us to create? Well, we'll get to the real questions because we got to go quickly here. Um, I'll let you answer this uh, one realistically, including. Okay, well, no, we already answered that actually. Um, 
Question from Milan Shrini. Um, which player do you want to keep, sell, and buy this summer? Um, do you think Milan should rise their wa- raise their wage cap, and what do the management need to do uh, to win the respect of the fans? We covered half of that, so just stick to the keep, sell, and buy for this summer. Um, keep. I mean, I think just to kind of narrow it down because I think everyone has every player has a price, right? Mm. But generally speaking, I think more so focusing on like the main core from the Scudetto winning season. I would love to keep everybody. Yeah. If you believe reports, I th- I'm not sure what the risk, most recent report was, but it seems to be that it could be either Menon or Teo. One of them are going to be the it's gonna be Tonali name. from this year, right? So I think that there's a pretty good chance that one of those players gets sold. I don't think it's going to be Tomori, although he didn't have the greatest of seasons. I think he plays such a crucial role for us in, in an area that we do need to, and he got hurt. to bolster. So I don't see how we can get rid of him. Um, so I do feel like based on the contract negotiations for Manon, he wants a significant pay hike. Um, you know, the injury concerns, I think that Milan might be in a position where they're going to sell now. And I, mm. it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. Um, so that's one player I would say sell again. I don't come for me. I don't want to get rid of these players. I, if I had my choice, you could pick Calabria. Manon and he's healthy and he plays. That's, I would love that. He's, you could pick David really Calabria. I won't stop on you. Um, I guess keep obviously Rafa Pulisic. Um, just I one, think... just one, just one of each. Yeah, Rafa. then you're good. Okay, so and then who are you buying? If you had to pick a buying... player, any player, doesn't matter the position. Who do you want? Sesco. Okay, Benjamin Sesco. Um, do 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 why does our management make things too complicated when they are about to choose a well-known coach why are we making the assumption that they're making this complicated i it's don't know it's me i think i think that hysteria is, is always going to be media driven i think what that what what yeah. fans do to themselves and this is something i've learned years ago and i encourage everybody who watches this listen to this follows us on twitter is is just consider the sources. The first people that will consider the sources, if they see that some ragtag source out of nowhere says Rafa could be sold for 100 million, they have this hysteria, they tweet, they get angry, but then they'll go around and say and buy into a, a reliable source. Well, yeah. if, you, if you lean on your reliable, reliable sources and you shoot down your unreliable sources, you don't have any problems. Like, why are you feeding energy into a source that has never given you anything reliable? In inconsistent so, sources. Um, yeah. I mean, even even Di Marzio, who's reliable. Like, let's think of the timeline, guys. Gallardo just got sacked in Saudi yeah. Arabia, and the first thing is like Milan are pressing for him. And I and I the way I was talking and addressing it was in hypotheticals. If this guy were to be hired, how would it go? Not this is going to happen. Right. There are different ways to approach it. I think people are under the assumption with this Lopetegui thing. I don't know how many times we have to talk about this. They're not making decisions based off of what we say solely. They obviously had doubts with Lopetegui. They're not just going to be like, ah, the fans don't like you. Then if that's the case, Paolo Maldini and Sandro Tonali are still with the club. Hate to break yeah, it. Yeah, these guys wouldn't have jobs if we had and- so much weight and impact. And 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 they and guess what? If they did what what the fans wanted, they would have been spending three hundred million yeah. this summer. Can we critically think for a moment here? Come on, guys, you're you're all better than that. Um, can Milan win the second star this coming season? No, I think things have to go their way, and Inter have to lose key players. Um, simple. If, if Milan pony up, like if it's, for example, probably won't happen. Thiago Santos at right back, Buongiorno for center back. Kepa Taram for, for the center defense and, and, Benjamin, and Benjamin Sesco. So we might see one. We might see one, guys. Yeah. So that if, if you want the second star, we need Also, that. guys, it's May 15th. Like, I, I love the questions on the transfer market. I love that. And um, I think there's, you know, we're in the New York you know, sports market, right? So I'm always listening to the, the ESPN radio, and I'm listening to the Knicks fans calling in. And the Knicks fans are calling in at before they won, what was it, game five? Mm-hmm. You know, they lost two straight and they were down. There was two, two now. And people were calling in saying, Oh, we got the injuries. This is this. What do we need to do in the off season? When you have games that actually mean something yeah. and you're still alive in Milan's yeah. case, 
in your defense to those to the fans that are asking these questions, we have nothing to play for. We have two games. We're second place. We're locked in on second place. There's literally nothing else to play for. Don't even have a manager. We don't even have a manager yet. And that's going to ultimately drive the ship and be the sort of driving force as to how our market's going to go. Because if we go with a manager that plays a 3-5-2, well, maybe we have to go and get another central defender because we, we're going to be playing three center backs or we have to go with mm-hmm. a more of a wing back profile versus someone who is more of that stay back right back. Right. So let let the chips fall where they may. Let the pieces fall into place. Let the coach come in. I, if I personally don't think the coach will be announced in the coming days like Antonio Vitiello reported and some of these other coaches. Uh, sources so they reported. say, yeah. I think the name will probably be cemented by the main sources, but it's not going to be announced in my opinion, until Pioli is done. Pioli is going to get a send and, off. Yeah, it's going to happen just like it did last year with Paolo Maldini. Season done, nothing to play for. Okay, now we're starting to assess the market. We're assessing our summer. This guy's gone. This guy's gone. We're keeping him. We're exercising this option. We're not using this option. So let the coach come in, and then we can kind of have that deeper conversation on the market approach. I'm glad that you brought up uh, basketball. So this is the second second to last question. This is from Christian Espinoza. I'm not sure if you have a strong opinion on this or have thought about it at all, Matt. Um, But is Jokic the greatest player since Miami LeBron? Greatest? I guess you can say greatest and dominant is the the two of this. The the best player since him. I think there's only one other option that you could pick. I mean, I'd be okay with. You say three, he's got three MVPs, correct? And he could go win back to back titles, correct? With not having an all star teammate, I mean, I think sheer dominance from a big man standpoint, I think that's pretty fair. I think if Giannis was able to win more and have some more sustained, I think Giannis is better. No, 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 but I'm just saying, like, I know, yeah, yeah. but I think it's 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 Jokic. I I would I would say that's pretty fair. Interesting. I think the only player I would say was better is or on that level was Steph. Um, but I don't agree that it was Steph. I think I think Joker doing more with less. Um, and by the way, not facing injured team. It's just Joker is. He's approaching. He's approaching the second best player this century. He's approaching that. He's going. There is a legitimate case to pass Kobe Bryant. What's, what's, really what's interesting with him too is he's a big man, and I grew up a Sixer fan, so I see You're Joel Embiid, AI. and I, well, I love the AI growing up. But I see that, that he really didn't have a great supporting cast, or maybe people could say he had a supporting cast to based on to what he needed because he was such a ball dominant player. Like he needed to take his shots to order to have Sixers do what they did. Um, but I think when you look at Embiid versus Jokic, Embiid is breaking down. Like we see him limping. We see him every breaking day. down every before day. our very eyes. And you see Jokic, he looks that he's built to last. A player it's that looks hilarious. like he could go on. Hilarious. He could, yeah, years and years and years. He puts himself if in he positions. Wants, yeah. He, yeah. So I think the dominance he's, is going to be there. He and, I'm, is. and I'm a big, and, and Martin, I'm a big believer. I'm sure you are. Is sustainability and the sustained success in order to judging in order to judge legacy and which player would be better than another player like Steph Curry has is obviously longevity but if we're talking over you know a full full career I mean Jokic can wind up having 15 seasons in the NBA be a 13 14 time all-star and be a five-time MVP, yeah, he, MVP he's right? a three-time MVP I don't think anyone and he was that's crazy listen, I, I give respect to Embiid but I still would have given it to Joker last year. The guy is incredible. He plays basketball the way it's meant to be played. And I think there hasn't been a better player outside of LeBron James than him. And he's doing it with a weaker supporting cast. I don't really kind of care about the Shaq and Kobe had each other. I don't think people realize that if you have a consensus top 10 all time teammate on your team, things are a lot fucking easier in basketball. Okay. Joker doesn't even have a top 50 fucking team. Murray's good, but he's not Kobe. Jamal Murray's incredible. He he elevates his game, but let's be serious here. Would you, like, if Kobe's best teammate is Shaq, he's, Jamal isn't even better than Pau Gasol, okay? There's so many different layers to this, so because, and I say this because people are going to point to championships. Put Kobe on the Nuggets and see what happens. Um, Final question to Gino. Um, and Max Lombardia, um, their partners, they do a great job in their podcast. Mm-hmm. So Gino um, 
says we want to win titles and go deep into the CL the next three seasons to set up cup runs for possible future wins. I think he's speaking in the hypothetical of this. Mm -hmm. So uh, what three key things would you introduce Milan into this season to help establish? This kind of just piggies back off of the market. For me, you hire Conceição, you get the guy that fits probably best with your formation, most proven guy with a little less drama than the Antonio Conte, which we've mentioned uh, so many times. I think you obviously have to pony up for the striker and the center back. I think you also make not an unpopular sale, but a sale that is probably a necessary sacrifice to push yourself further towards titles and I think it's sort of like a player in that 20 to 30 million range. We'll see. Um, but for me, I think you do that. But, you know, you have to have that. Because if you don't pony up for a strike, like if it's Jonathan David, right, which is still not out of the question. If it's Jonathan David, you don't have that deep CL. Deep CL is, you really need to get a good break for that, okay? I think for as far as competing for titles, you need guys who can compete now. Um, and yeah. and I think you have to pony up for that. I think it's getting a top manager. I don't – Marcelo Gallardo, right? We'll talk about this tomorrow. I think it's too risky of a move to guarantee saying something like that. So what would you your three big moves be? So I guess I would assume striker for you. Just Coach is one, market Coach is one. Coach is one. Coach is one. I just want because still... I think if we we can get a striker that like a Sesco type, but it's if it's going to be a young striker, you have to have the coach that's going to get the most out of that young striker and that investment. And I think that was kind of one of the issues that we saw with the Ketelare, right? Like we spent a, a substantial amount of money on a player that we deemed to be a difference maker going forward, and we didn't handle it the way we should have handled it, or we didn't get enough out of a player that we should have gotten. Right. And then he goes to another team and he's producing and it's like, OK, that's where coaching can raise the level. Right. The margins become, begin to kind of broaden. You're like, OK, with good coaching, a lot of players in this team that are underperforming or not as sharp or that are maybe development is stunted a bit. They can take the next level. And I think that's where I really put the coach above all, because that's the trickle down effect. If you get a Conte and you get someone who can really motivate a lot of players in the team that we currently have will take the next step. There might be players that don't see eye to eye with the coach. But I think at the end of the day, we know how impactful a coach can be. In this era, it's proof that money isn't the, always the, the cure. Ask Chelsea how they're feeling. Ask Manchester, Manchester United. United yeah. Right? The coach is the crucial thing. Milan have to get the right coach in here. That should be announced very soon. And then I think it's striker because I think that's going to really set the tone for what Milan tried to do going forward. And I mentioned it earlier. We talked about the attack. that I mean, we now have options in the attack. If you add a great coach with a true difference maker up front, the goals, that is going to be contagious. That's going to be something that galvanizes, in my opinion, this team because it's such a focal point. Look at the year that that Inter won the title under, um, under Conte. When they had Lukaku – and Lautaro, they had a lot of great players in that team, but always the conversation was, in, in many parts, was, man, look what Conte is doing with Lukaku and Lautaro up front. And they dominated games it with dominated. those two players doing what they did. So I think that's what the conversation has to be. So coach, striker, and then I would probably start saying, look, above all the, you know, maybe not above, but with in addition to some of the other areas that we need to address, I think we need to start having young players make that move up. I think Kevin that Milan really start to be, they, they got to start doing that. They got to start getting the next couple of players. I think Stimmage, Stimmage is a must. Stimmage yeah. is a must to be yeah. in this squad next year. I really do. I, it's just, it's. I think what Milan have done has been solid in terms of sustainability, but I think everybody and anyone would agree that it's about the leap. Like, like a big broad jump. You know what a broad jump is, guys? It's when you're standing in one position and you jump as far as you can from that position to as far as you can go. And I think what Milan can do is have a summer where, and it's funny because the outlook like in 2017, this will be my final thought before we head out. In 2017, this is when Matt and I even started doing all this stuff. When Bonucci was purchased by Milan, right? 
specifically Bonucci, right? Aside from all the money that was coming in. The Bonucci purchase was like a signal of we know intent. who we are. Intent, yeah. We know who we are. We know what shit. <laughs> we know what this means, right? Yeah. I think if you make a move like and exactly you share the video and the comment by Paolo Maldini prior to the first leg of the Champions League semifinal last year. Know the moment, own the moment, and go for it. I think Milan can still do that and stay within their financial parameters. I think it's going to be at the expense of Mike Magnan being sold. Yeah. The, if if I think he's going to get sold regardless. If not, he stays one more year. They take a they take less on the money. But seriously, I think there is a, a reason where fans can be optimistic, but they have to do it with a really strong purchase. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. Um we appreciate you guys so much. We love answering these Thank questions. You. We love doing these podcasts. We're going to have another one tomorrow with Roberto Rojas, a good friend of ours. We're going to be discussing Marcelo Gallardo a little bit to see what what direction Milan could be going in there. Hugo Cuenca, um, and then Santi Jimenez, who is also another striker linked to the club. So you're going to be getting a bunch of content tomorrow on top of what you just watched. Again, like, subscribe, comment your thoughts on the situation heading into next season with Milan. Please uh, follow Matt on Twitter at Matt underscore Santangelo and at AC Milan Bros. It's been on the ticker this entire time. And again, follow us at That Milan Podcast on Twitter at That Milan Pod. Again, audio, Apple, Spotify, wherever else you get your audio um, from, go ahead there. We also have the video uploaded as well. Um, and then again, if you want to follow me at Martino Puccio on Twitter, at Martino underscore Puccio on Instagram. Uh, final comments, Matt, before we go, I think wrapped everything up there yeah um i don't know what in our martina will we'll have these internal discussions i don't know what the rest of the season is going to look like as far as like previews reviews i mean again we really don't have much to play for but we'll uh keep you guys posted on anything that we're going to be putting out so uh just to piggyback off of martino says follow us on twitter follow us um on youtube subscribe to the podcast and apple and spotify you'll get all your updated uh content episodes uh, exclusive player profiles. I know we did, um, you know, a couple on Sesco and Xerxy a little while back. Sesco so and Xerxy, yep. Mm -hmm. You guys can go check those out too. Um, anything we're working on, again, though, we'll uh, we'll keep you guys posted on social media. Yeah, uh, hopefully getting someone for Jonathan David as well. I have been slacking on that. Adrian Rabona of Rabona TV gave us a suggestion, so we'll try and reach out as soon as possible. We meant for this to go for 25 minutes. We went for 58, so in typical fashion, thank you guys so much for listening to us ramble. Take care and see you next time.